Hello everyone and welcome to this new online live conversation of L'Ecole, the School of Jewelry Arts. It's a pleasure to welcome you today for this virtual tour within the new exhibition of L'Ecole entitled Engraved Gems. My name is Gislao Kroman, I'm a Jewelry historian and the conference project manager of L'Ecole and I'm delighted to be with Philippe Malguir. Hello. Hello. Who is the head curator at the Louvre Museum in the Department of Art Objects, but also happens to be the curator of this Engraved Gems exhibition. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for taking some time with us. And before we start, um, for some of you that know already how everything works, or also for some who are newcomers, just a few, let's say, uh, information, technical information, housekeeping details, as we say, so you know how everything works. This is a one-hour talk, including in the ending, a 10 to 15 minutes Q&A session, which means that we will answer your questions by the very ending. Do not hesitate to write your question in the Q&A box our moderator, Alice, from the Hong Kong team of L'Ecole, will be there with you. And on WeChat, Mina, from the Shanghai team of L'Ecole, will just collect your questions, gather them all, and send them to me by the very ending in order to answer them properly at the, at the final part of this virtual tour. This talk um, will be recorded and will be available on the replays of Lickle afterwards via YouTube, the YouTube channel of Lickle, maybe you know already, where all the talks could be found. I'm sure Alice on Zoom will send you the link so you will have the information if you want to register already to have all the, the details. So let's start in this exhibition, which has uh, over 200 pieces on display. This exhibition, it's a one-of-a-kind presentation of never-seen-before cameos, intaglios, rings, engraved gems, which have been loaned thanks to a private collector who generously allowed to present them within the school exhibition. But let's start with some definitions, because I think we have already touched upon some of the words, uh, intaglio, cameos, engraved gems. Can you just give us the, um, the meaning of what is an intaglio, what is a cameo? So the, um, the theme, the subject of ex exhibition is our glyptics, mm -hmm. which is maybe a cryptic word. It just means to carve, to engrave from a Greek word. And there are basically two ways of doing glyptic in, in stones. Uh, one way is to carve hollow figures in a, in, a, in a stone. We'll see the stones later. Or to carve something in the round or in relief. And those two techniques are distinguished um, since medieval time. The one in, in hollow being intaglio and the one in relief being cameo. So it may sound a bit abstract or not even very useful to know this distinction, but we will see that the same stones won't be used in, in, the, in, in both cases. So it's a, a distinction very important to make. The other one is that uh, intaglio technique, so in hollow, was invented first to make prints, like a stamp. So the image would be reversed and appear in positive, where it's in negative in, in the stone. And this goes back 5,000 uh, years. So it's a very, very ancient technique and concern to be able to leave a print on clay or wax or whatever. Cameo were invented much later. That is to say, they are more than 2,000 years old, which is not quite... It's very old, but, <laughs> yes, more but not, not that an as ancient as intaglio. So uh, uh, maybe we can see first an example of, of these uh, intaglios in this uh, ring, uh, which features Agrippa, who was a very important uh, political figure of uh, um, uh, Emperor Auguste Entourage. And it's a 19, uh, excuse me, 18th century uh, intaglio made in, in amethyst, but copying a Roman ancient coin. Uh, with this portrait. So uh, the wearer of this ring could use it also as a personal seal to uh, close a letter with wax, for instance. And the real beauty of the carving is only revealed when you stamp the intaglio in some soft material for you can distinguish, mm -hmm. as you see on the screen, the image. It has uh, a very practical reason initially, really, as you said. Yes, so you may enjoy it on your finger, but mm -hmm. you may also use it for practical reasons. We'll mm -hmm. speak later more about that. 
uh, cameos, uh, on the other hand, are not meant to have any um, practical use. They're just meant to be seen, to be enjoyed, to be looked at. And they're usually made in layered stones, as you say, in, in stone having different colors within their structure. So you can see, I think, now an example of this on, on, on your screen, and we'll see more of this. What we may say, but uh, we may uh, already know this important point, but there is this practical origin of uh, stone carving, of glyptics, in the, the desire to create stamps, as you understand it. But cameos were mainly born out of the beauty of a stone, of the desire to enrich the stone with images when there were already all this beauty because of its color. And that's a very important thing to say if we want to now re reverse to the stones themselves, that they are not precious stones, for, for there are some pieces carved out of ruby or sapphire or even emeralds and, and even diamond in modern, in modern times. But usually for glyptic, we don't care about the, va the value, the commercial value of a stone, but just for its color. Mm -hmm. And so they are mainly colored stones. Uh, well, this is what we, we just yeah. see uh, over there on the, on the case in here. We can see the, the bright colors in here, and we thank very much uh, Philippe Nicolas, who is the glyptician at Cartier, who maybe, if you attended the formal conversation, was one of the speakers who presented the glyptic arts with his own contemporary point of view. Uh, over there in here, we see lots of stones which, if I'm not mistaken, belong to the quartz family for most of them. Why were these stones chosen and what are they, these stones? So, uh, as you say, uh, they are mainly quartz, though we never use really this, this name to design them. They have a many different names which were given in time from the Roman period Onward, mm -hmm. sometimes they are named from Persia, from the Arabic, from the Greek, from Latin, and it's a very, it's a maze, really, the names of a stone. Uh, we could start with, uh, in, in this quartz family, there are two types, uh, those with small crystal, small, uh, uh, which we call micro uh, crystalline, and those with big crystal, which are macro uh, crystalline. Those with big crystal tend to be transparent, and the others with small crystal tend to be just uh, translucent or even totally uh, dense. So the, the V stone for glyptics from the most ancient period is uh, the one we call carnelian. Carnelian is this orange uh, quartz. Uh, the, the color is heightened by man, by heating. So it's not, it's both a natural colored uh, stone, but it's on the, also a man, uh, a stone um, man worked on uh, it's since. Both, it's both the color from nature, but also there is an intervention of yes, a man. Yes, uh, man noted that by heating it, okay. you could uh, heighten this uh, orange color. Mm -hmm. So uh, the same stone, basically the same kind of quartz, when it's this kind of grayish blue, it's called chalcedony. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it's uh, denser and with bright red, it's called a jasper, a red jasper. Mm -hmm. There are also black jaspers, which some people would call onyx. So it's mm -hmm. quite complicated. Um, uh, we may note this a special jasper, which is both green and red, which we call heliotrope or blood jasper. We'll see pieces carved out of, uh, of this. The macrocrystalline uh, quartzes are uh, main, uh, the one mainly used in, in, in glyptics are uh, rock crystal and amethyst you see uh, there. There are also other stones besides quartzes mm -hmm. uh, like uh, lapis lazuli, turquoise, jade and any colored stone which we <laughs> don't even know how to name might be used for uh, glyptics. What is interesting, you mentioned there are also different sorts of families of gemstones. Here we have all of them presenting, let's say, one major color. But you also mentioned there are other stones with layers of colors, which we use also for cameos. What are they? So they're from the same, basically from the same family. They are quartz, uh, micro crystalline mm -hmm. quartz. And uh, they have different names, mainly they're within the range of uh, agate. But uh, more specifically, we call them sardonyx. 
-hmm. when they're the, the old cameo stone. You have a beautiful example of this. So you see that's from the way uh, the, the, the geological history of a stone, it built in this kind of different layers, which are, um, the stone is, is, is the same, but it depends on the density, like in a tree, you know, you see the, the it, it's, it's a question of density. And uh, also this stone could be made even more beautiful by cooking, soaking into sh uh, sugar or honey, and uh, to get these grayish parts, uh, browner and even uh, very dark. And this was done since um, uh, antiqui antiquity. So to make this uh, Anderson more um, maybe clearly, we have this example of this um, kind of layered stone, uh, very uh, clear, very yeah. definite here. Mm -hmm. And we have some example when it's more blurred and, and more difficult to, to find a real structure. And we can see this double uh, portrait in a cameo, how because of the thickness of the uh, um, white um, uh, stratum uh, separating the two darker one, the, the sculptor had to make a very thick cameo to have a possibility of using all the colors, like uh, in the stone. In other cameos, these layers might may, may be very close to each other. And uh, for instance, we have cameos with uh, uh, two, three, four, up to eight different layers of mm. color. So the, the, the technician, the glyptician, would adapt according to the stone. When we look at this sort of meat sort of figure piece of gemstone to, to move to the cameo over there, we really understand how long, how complicated is the process. And next to me there are some tools. So how could we, with these tools, create the cameos, create the intaglios? What was the process? So the important thing about glyptic is to understand that though it looks like sculpture because you take some material, uh, I mean, off some of raw, mm -hmm. off of it. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the technique is totally different from sculpture because there's no question of uh, percussion or... Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not hammering the stone. It's not hammering the stone okay. or... It's done with drilling. Mm. So, um, since antiquity, uh, it may be a very simple device with a bow, for instance, a drill with a bow. We have images of Egyptians uh, doing that in antiquity. And then uh, this drill uh, this could be uh, moved with a lathe, so uh, moved by a, a pedal, for instance, by the artist himself, or by uh, hydraulic force with a water mill, then with electricity. Okay. But the important thing to understand is that um, uh, for all these thousands of years, so the implementation changed and um, uh, steel tools came in and so on. The basics of the technique didn't change until very recently. Okay. So you have this rotating uh, device, mm -hmm. um, this, this drill or this lathe, and you can put, it, uh, put on it different, uh, what they call bits in English, different mm -hmm. tools, which are usually made by the carver himself to mm -hmm. suit his, his needs. But this tool won't be uh, hard enough to carve this stone, which, which are quite hard. So it will use a, a powder of corundum, which is the, of the same nature as sapphires and, and, and rubies, or even, uh, indeed, a diamond powder mixed with olive oil, that was the antique recipe, grind it together, and covering the bit with this mixture could uh, make Yes, uh, carve uh, into this stone. So it's the half powder which is carving the stone, not exactly, the drill itself. Exactly. Okay. So it's this very patient uh, work and very lengthy process which will allow uh, to create these incredible pieces we, 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 we are going to see. And if we imagine the, the difficulty, because you can't move the tool um, around the object, you mm -hmm. have to adjust constantly the object on the, on, on the tool and change tool. And if you, now we know this, maybe we'll even appreciate them more uh, in, in a different way. Of course, it's a long time for each process yes. of creating, which is, which is something fabulous. What is interesting within the exhibition is that we really understand both the technical and the artistic achievements in the, in the realization. Uh, you were mentioning initially that cameos, intaglios, glyptic art started thousands and thousands of years ago. So they start with intaglio. How did everything start? Where in the world did it start? Do we know? 
Well, it's, it's, many of these stones are coming from India. Mm -hmm. And there are, uh, there is quartz everywhere in the world, but uh, the Indus civilization uh, started making uh, carnelian beads, mm -hmm. uh, and that was really thousands of years ago. So this is the region of Gujarat mm -hmm. uh, now, and many of the stones probably came from there. So the, this technique developed in this area in Mesopotamia, so actual uh, Iraq, Iraq yeah. and uh, Syria, Syria parts, yes. Iran, and East. in antique Egypt. Okay. Yes. So all, all these things moved with the first intaglio, you said, for functionality, printing your seal, printing your idea. But we're moving towards Egypt, in particular, uh, Greco-Egypt uh, civilization, with the first cameos. How did things happen at this very moment, and why this very special time, if we know it? Well, we, <laughs> to be clear, we don't know it, but uh, at some time the idea of using these colored, these complex stones to create, uh, to bring color to sculpture naturally, not by coloring sculpture, which is a very current uh, process, mm -hmm. but to play somehow uh, with nature through the stone, appears in the second century before Christ or around this uh, date. And it's probably a consequence of uh, Alexander's uh, conquest in the East because, as you know, he went as far as India. Course, and yeah. probably uh, there was a more fluid uh, circulation of, of goods and these stones yeah. were, uh, came uh, more easily to and the, not only war, there to was the some Mediterranean. Yeah, yes, of indeed. course. So that's a possibility. But still, it's a very debated question where exactly when cameo appears, but we may, may say it's the Hellenistic period around uh, 200 uh, years before Christ. Okay, so after Alexander the Great, the yes, dynasty who yes. took over the power, and the Ptolemaic dynasty was in Egypt at the exactly. time. Exactly. So that's from this Ptolemaic period, we have really the first masterpieces of um, cameo engraving. Okay. Here we have a few examples. There's one cameo which is very complex. You were talking about the multi-layered stones. Is this one a good example? Yes, uh, yes, indeed it is. And uh, it's even more than that because he, the, the sculpture achieved to make four different plans. You mm -hmm. see, the, the background and three profiles, so that's mm -hmm. four. And, and in fact, there are only three layers. There's only a dark one, a white one, and a brown one. But making the white one very thin, you have this gray color, which is not really in the stone. It's just because by transparency, you can see the black mm -hmm. um, at the back of the white. So uh, it shows all the degrees of, of subtlety of using the stone. And the, this image is particularly interesting because uh, cameo, they're so um, kind of elitist production made for the court and um, for their own concern, which is about uh, power, uh, legitimacy, mm -hmm. and so, so the on. iconography is political. Mainly. Exactly. So mm -hmm. it's, it's the ruler, which is this small uh, brown figure. And uh, at the back, there are the two great founders of the dynasty was part of. So it's the kind of a last of a newcomer, but with this kind of prestigious, uh, uh, prestigious and almost mm -hmm. mythical uh, background, which is okay. very clear e even from the, the, stone, uh, the stone itself. And this political dimension of uh, court cameos is something important to remember. Okay, here we have a standard which we will see a lot with cameos, is the background is in the darkest color, the clearest color, the lightest color will be more for the figures, and the details would have the sort of brownish color. It's something, a standard that was basically developed at the time, we think? Yes, of course, um, but it, it, it may, you may have two layered or up to, as I said, eight. Many, yeah, eight. Eight, eight layers. So, but the, we, may, we might say that basically in Greek and Roman cameos, mm -hmm. the flesh tones are always in the uh, light, the light color. Okay. Here we have an example with another figure. It looks to me the layers are in an other position. How did the artist make this sort of a, a mythological figure? Yeah, so it's a, it's a kind of mixture of an, an Egyptian goddess with a Greek one. Mm -hmm. So the iconography is not at all Egyptian, as you can see. It looks like Greek art, mm -hmm. but she has a small uh, kind of object on her head, which mm -hmm. may um, allow us to understand that it's Isis 
-hmm. and not only Demeter as uh, she could be. And you see that the, the idea of this image came from uh, the meditation of the artist on the stone, and he decided to use this white streak to make the, the kind of uh, the border like um, of a veil, like mm -hmm. if it was embroidered or of, of a different color, and the very dark hair, and the very white face in the white layer. But uh, obviously, it's a more complex stone to, to use, and the image also is very elaborate. Mm. They are rare and luxury objects, as we would see. Uh, do we know at the time how they were worn? Because the mounting is not always the, the original, the ancient one. How they were worn? Were they worn in, as jewelry? Were they worn an object? What was the, the use of them? Well, we don't know as much as we <laughs> wished uh, about this, but what is clear is all these objects came in um, uh, reaching us today. They were maybe they came out of excavation, but most of the time they were kept in as precious objects. Okay. So and they were passed on to yes, people. so okay. they, they might have been mounted on jewelry, of course, on any kind of precious vessels, mm -hmm. on musical instruments, even on furniture. Okay. So we have evidence of uh, by text of that. Mm -hmm. And they were always considered very valuable. So they were dismounted all the time and transformed into new objects. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even recut to adapt uh, to adapt okay. or transform when mm -hmm. the emperor was not a beloved one and he was dead so okay. they would change his portrait to another one and so sure. it's a very complicated yeah. so subject they, they were luxury goods transformed over the ages yes uh, let's leave alexandria and the greek world to move on to the roman empire and here we have an example of the one who was the first roman emperor augustus over here uh, it's a it's a ruby which is there. It's, it looks very rare because we know the ruby is from <coughs> the east, the far east. What do we know about such piece? So it's, yes, it's basically a, a, a ruby from Burma. Uh, Burma. And so it could be made uh, evident by the composition of a mm -hmm. stone. And it's really in phase of with what we know about uh, um, precious stone being used by by Roman period. Mm -hmm. So what is interesting is that Roman before the empire, uh, they were very stern uh, people, very uh, reluctant to have uh, luxury goods. Mm -hmm. and quite austere look. Quite austere, mm -hmm. and they thought all this was kind of oriental and decadent. Mm -hmm. But in, at the end of the Republic, they looted uh, big collections of precious objects from uh, the east of the Mediterranean mm -hmm. and brought in Rome the taste for rings with stones, half stones, precious stones, and mm -hmm. so on. So with this taste came Greek artists to work to the court of Augustus. They were not Roman, they were Greeks. And one of them was Dioscorides, uh, who signed, you know, like a great painter would, mm -hmm. some stones we ha still have, and we know he engraved uh, a portrait of Augustus to uh, be used by the emperor himself as his personal seal is okay. uh, for uh, personal dispatches. Okay. So an official artist from the court. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And uh, we have good ground to think that this ruby was the one carved by this Dioscorides mm -hmm. for Augustus himself. And it's a very... Uh, I mean, uh, when you see it in, 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 re in the flesh, so to speak, it's, it's a very small uh, ruby with a beautiful color, but it's very difficult to distinguish the quality of the carving. Mm -hmm. And even when you print it, you see it's very so deep and so alive. I mean, it's, uh, what is very striking is that this portrait has also uh, uh, an almost uh, psychological quality. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're so, they not just an effigy, uh, yeah. you know, uh, um, it's a physical and moral portrait, even it, of, exactly. the, of the Exactly, and you can see the elderly uh, August with a kind of bitter thing around his, his mouth and a very private portrait. And so okay. it sounds also very well with the idea that it was made for August himself and it's not a propaganda 
uh, cameo. Okay, so quite a one of a kind piece. Yes, within it's, the, it's, the collection. it's unique to have this this kind of object. Yes. This sort of piece reminds us the very political side of cameos and intaglios from Egypt to Rome. We have on the other side an illustration of a quite large cameo which is there, which happens to be later, as you said, demounted, remounted. So this is a, a Napoleon the first period mount. Um, I've read on the documentation, it was a gift from a pope to an archchancellor from the court of Napoleon. What was this piece was worthy to be a gift from a pope? So uh, in the end of 18th century, uh, cameos were the thing to, to have. Okay. And even new cameos were created all the time, Rome being the center of this industry. Mm -hmm. But to have ancient cameo, of course, was much more difficult. Mm -hmm. And so it was totally appropriate for a pope also being a Roman, you know, so a kind of heir of the, um, the emperors of course, yeah. to offer to another emperor who was more an upstart somehow, self-proclaimed um, emperor to bring something genuine, you know, uh, so there maybe so there was... Way to legitimate it. <laughs> yes, or a way of to recall, you know, uh, mm -hmm. some truths about um, sure. what is an uh, empire. But to come to the piece itself, uh, so it's probably from the time of um, around 200 after Christ, so mm -hmm. it's almost two centuries after Augustus, where there is uh, under uh, Septimus Severus a strong revival of propaganda glyptics, if mm -hmm. I may say so, and especially to show the emperor himself in the guise of a god or to give, uh, to. Um, Put the portrait, the face of the emperor on the image of a god. Mm -hmm. In this instance, Jupiter, of course, who is the king of, of gods. So it's a, it's a very way to to connect the king of the gods to the emperor of the mortals in a way on one piece. Uh, celebrating figures was important in many ways, from the pieces in here to Augustus to Severus to Alexander. We have a case over there only dedicated to Alexander the Great. What was this character so important? So, uh, well, it, it was um, a time changer. I mean, this first empire of Alexander, would, for it was a very brief story and it's tragic true. because he died very young. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a kind of um, ideal for all the rulers. So a, any empire coming after Alexander would try to be a new Alexander. A new yeah. Alexander. Okay. So there was this obsession with Alexander, and uh, we had no real portraits of Alexander mm -hmm. for a reason or another, uh, authentic portraits. So we okay. had to rely on other images. Okay. And one of those was uh, an image created while he, uh, he was in Egypt, where through some political manipulation he was acclaimed by the clergy of the god Ammon, mm -hmm. uh, who is um, a god uh, who has many shapes, but one of the shapes is um, a ram. Mm -hmm. So with this... With the horns that will be horns, twisting this yes, way. Okay. Twisted horns, a special ram. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, this god would say, this is my son to the new ruler of Egypt. Okay. So the predecessor of Ptolemies, of we've just seen. And so this image of this man, this Greek, with this horn on the side of his head mm -hmm. is, was so striking, it was repeated on all the coins of the successors of Alexander. Mm -hmm. So it was a very popular image already in antiquity, mm -hmm. worn on, on fingers, for instance, Indeed. in antiquity. And we have this very beautiful uh, Renaissance uh, cameo, very delicate. So you see here he, he didn't decide to have a very contrasting stone, but mm -hmm. he, it's almost as, as if he were a uh, blonde uh, yeah, man, blonde you know, and, and even the background. So, and, and, and thinning this black, this white uh, stratum to make it translucent, you see in VI and giving this very fleshy, very tender, very fragile uh, look. It proves how the imagery moves from one period to the other. Let's leave antiquity, if we, if we wish, and move on to the Middle Ages. Um, as you said, for, for a long time, on all the documents about the exhibition, there was a long time with like no cameos, but things were not totally lost. And I, I invite you just to move to Byzantium over there. Okay. What happened at the beginning of the Middle Ages with cameos? So we can say basically that it disappeared uh, with uh, 
barbaric invasions mm -hmm. uh, from the west totally. Okay. But in the east, where uh, somehow under a different guise, uh, the uh, Eastern Empire continue into the form of the Byzantium mm -hmm. Empire, uh, Glyptic survived, mm -hmm. but in a very uh, specific ways, mainly for religious objects, re which are technically icons, mm -hmm. like the painted icons we're more familiar with, and meant to be worn as a protection. Mm -hmm. So they're mainly saints, Christ, the Virgin, and, uh, and mainly also made in this special stone I mentioned uh, previously, mm -hmm. which is this uh, quartz, both red and um, uh, green. Mm -hmm. uh, blood jasper. Blood so. jasper mm -hmm. or heliotrope. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to have uh, magical virtues. So mm -hmm. the image was both efficient because of the... Um, of the image on it, the sacred yeah, but also image, the but also because of a stone It's used. sort of an, an, a talisman or an amulet. A talisman, absolutely. Okay, okay, mm. great. This illustration is nice. It has on one side Jesus Christ, on the other side the Virgin Mary. Yes. Um, it, it was worn, you mean, uh, if it was worn this way, as something protecting, something protecting you from exactly. the evil. Exactly. So this is not the original Indeed, mounting, which yes. must have been wider and with pearls or precious stones. A large and, amount in, yes, with lots yes, of decorations. Yes, yes. Okay, I see. This is one of the great examples because Byzantium was the, the, the Christian heir of the Roman Empire in the East, as you said. But if we move towards to the West on the other side, um, how things just came back to life in the cameo world? So it first started in Sicily. Mm -hmm at the instigation of a very uh, incredible character, which is uh, Frederick II Hohenstaufen, who uh, was emperor and king of Sicily. Mm -hmm. And in his time, he was called Stupor Mundi, which is stupefaction of the world, mm -hmm. because he was such a man had never existed before. Sure. So he revived many uh, things from antiquity, and among those, the technique of glyptics. And those cameos of a, a federation time, which were uh, not really understood until recently because we, have, we thought they were just antiquities, uh, Roman or Greek. They have this white background with uh, brown figures, which, which is, is the opposite of what yes, we've seen. The opposite, but all the themes are taken from antiquity with a different inflection and sometimes with a Christian meaning or mm -hmm. astrological innuendos mm -hmm. and. Uh, so it's, 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 it's quite um, extraordinary to have three of these cameos in the exhibition because in the world we know like maybe 20 of those. So okay. they're still very rare and made in a very short span of time for the court of this. So having three, it's a lot within yes, the exhibition. Yes, it's a lot. Okay. And, and the other piece next to it, it's even uh, rarer because it's uh, uh, v one of the very few testimonies of uh, stone carving in France in 13th century, late 13th century. Mm -hmm. And we know this for sure because uh, the collector discovered it was among the possession of King uh, Charles V of France in, 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 in his late uh, uh, 14th century inventory. Mm -hmm. And we know that the king wore this ring with the crucifixion, the death of Christ on it, all the Fridays. So it's, it's called the Friday ring Mm. to commemorate the death of Christ, which was on a Friday. Mm -hmm. So he would wear this special ring on this what very day. What is date. interesting, in many of the pieces you did mention, there are lots of men's jewels within the, the presentation. Yes. That's, yes. that's an important point, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, if we move towards the other side, uh, we have an evolution of him. A creature, which is Medusa. Medusa, this creature with the, the hair made out of snakes, petrifying people, changing them into stone. This topic, like Alexander the Great, is something very recurrent within the history of cameos. Why that? And uh, just as you said, there, it's an image mainly created for men and for warriors mm -hmm. from the start because it's a protective, it's a mask uh, supposed to terrify your enemy, to make mm -hmm. them stand still, to petrify them almost. And the genuine Medusa in archaic Greek period, she has also this tongue like uh, an Indian goddess, you know, okay. so she's to very scare scary people. Okay. Uh, people. So in, in Roman period, she became more uh, quiet, as you can see, but was still the uh, permanent uh, ornament of a uh, suit of armor mm -hmm. as 
a protective device for the person wearing it. Okay. So it could be just an, embossed or engraved on the, um, on the metal, but would probably in some cases be um, with elements of art stone inlaid. Mm. To uh, other statues? Or yeah, or to, or to statues or to actual pieces equipment. of armor. Yes, okay. prestigious okay. Uh, suit of armor. Great. And yeah. all of them, were they all more or less worn by men or did this evolve in time? Well, it was mainly a main jewel even uh, for rings mm -hmm. in antiquity because it, was, uh, it has this, this protective power. And uh, men in um, modern period, say the 17th, 18th century, would like to wear, it was a very manly subject to wear and not to have a kind of... A, something more uh, deemed more elegant, but maybe more feminine. Yes, sure. But in, in late 19th century, it tended to be used for uh, women jewelry mm -hmm. also, because it has all this romantic and sim symbolist mm -hmm. uh, connotation like the, the, the brooch. Uh, we can see in this case. Sort of changing the interpretation, the reading yes. over Medusa exactly. from time to time. Great. It's, it's like a femme fatale, you know, yes. um, <laughs> character in the end of 19th century. Okay. If we move to the Renaissance period, which was a great revival of the, of the, of the ancient figures, here over there, there is what we have selected as the poster of the exhibition. Um, it is the hero Hercules, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Why this piece is, is different than what we've seen before. So there are several things you can uh, note about this, this subject. We make it a typical Renaissance uh, cameo. Because Renaissance is, uh, we have seen that in, in medieval time there, we, there was this interest, they started gathering them. But in the Renaissance, they started collecting them, mm -hmm. studying them, trying to learn things about antiquity from this study. Mm -hmm. And uh, while the knowledge was getting more precise, uh, they, the artists wanted to have a major freedom, not to be like blocked within in the imitation of antiquity, mm -hmm. and to use, for instance, this mottled. Uh, stones with color not so pr a bit blurred, uh, not clearly uh, structured. So that would be very typical of a Renaissance cameo. Also the size, you see, it's, 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 quite, very large, it's yeah. quite big. And the, the use of this stone is um, uh, what I would call poetic, which is essential to understand Renaissance scriptics, because uh, you can see both the stone and the image at the same time. Mm -hmm. Somehow in ancient cameo, you lose touch of the reality of a stone. You just see the colors. But here, the image is like delving in, into the stone and, and the other way around. So you could see the inspiring process of, of the stone to the artist and the relationship of the artist to nature, mm -hmm. creating these shapes and himself playing with them. So it, they are more complex because maybe we know more about them in, in their uh, relationship to, to nature and to the be natural beauty of stone. And with this playfulness is here exemplified in, in the way that the two paws of a, of the lion, of a yeah. lion uh, skin are just uh, put out you see in the white layer, and that's the, the, the thicker part yeah, of the sculpture. I can really getting off yes, the sculpture yes. so yeah, it, in it, a natural it's way. Not just playing with the, the subject. This object was, as you said, for many cameos, an object of pleasure to look at. Was it worn or just was it no, in a collection? No, no, it's just to, meant to be collected and mm -hmm. enjoyed probably uh, in some cabinet, you know, this um, sure. piece of furniture with a lot of drawers. So okay. you would keep this thing, take them out and discuss it with a friend and put it back okay. where... Uh, where it was. A conversation piece, we could e say. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Shall we move to uh, something probably more political? We'll, we'll leave Hercules for someone wearing pretty much the same skin, lion skin, exactly. but this time it's a woman. Why is this piece important within the exhibition? So this woman uh, working the, this um, lion skin is uh, in mythology Omphale, mm -hmm. and she kind of uh, out of love or desire, whatever, she persuaded Hercules to remove his manly garb mm -hmm. and to give it to her. And he would dress like a woman and wave and, and, and broad and do womanly okay. things. So, so it's they a, would switch their attributes. Yes, yes they would okay. switch their attributes. So as this is the portrait of Queen Elizabeth I of England, mm -hmm. we understand immediately what is the political content, that is to say she would 
uh, assume this heroic and very manly uh, costume to say I'm a woman, but I'm a, I'm a man also. Mm, I'm a yeah. ruler, and, and okay. I'm a uh, powerful yeah. ruler of a powerful country. Like I'm the woman, she's the king. That's the idea. Exactly. Sort of the, the ruler of the country. E e exactly. And uh, this was made probably by a member of a Miseroni family, where mm -hmm. a very reputed uh, carver from Milan in northern Italy. And they use a stone taken not from India or from far away, but from the Alps, okay. which is a very special agate you can see with this red and translucent, almost like acetone we saw in mm -hmm. the first case, inside. And he will also play with the uh, way of not polishing the flesh parts. So mm -hmm. they, they look softer mm -hmm. than uh, the costume, which is mm -hmm. bright. And it makes a contrast, really. A contrast mm -hmm. within the same color. Mm -hmm. And not only color. between the, the layers of, course, of, yeah. of the stone. So it's a, and uh, though we know many small portraits of Elizabethan glyptics, in small cameos to be worn by uh, courtiers mm -hmm. as badges of um, admiration, love, or whatever. Uh, this is the, the, the only piece of this kind, uh, even for any ruler of uh, modern Europe. It's really an uh, exceptional piece. Indeed. Um, we have walked through the ages. Um, we have sort of a conclusion large case which is there, which is a presentation of 2,000 years of rings. Uh, the collector, when he started, started by wearing the rings as a man collecting. Why this case is important, can you pick up maybe a few of them that, that matter the most within the collection? So the many of these stones were made to be worn on rings because the ring would be the, the personal object you would always carry with you mm -hmm. and you could put your print because you, we must know that in this period there were no keys mm -hmm. before late antiquity. So if you want to close something, not only a letter, but a piece of furniture, you, mark with you put a, a, uh, some clay or some wax and yes. just put your Finger. You to close it. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. So he was fascinated by that because normally uh, these personal rings and those bearing the name, for instance, would be destroyed after the death of a person because not to be used to create false documents, for of instance. So um, th there is a connection. So some of them are made of solid gold and do not really have a stone. Mm -hmm. So I would just mention, just passing through these very heavy Roman rings, from the third century after Christ, but they have uh, more ancient engravings. So mm -hmm. this is the problem with uh, the study of glyptic, that these stones were constantly uh, reused and remounted on mm -hmm. other objects. That's the case also with this um, Seljukid ring, which is quite a rare example, which has an earlier Sassanid stone on it. So it, it's sort of upcycling the pieces to something new and better uh, for, for the next generation, I would say. Uh, uh, Exactly, and we have the same process in uh, medieval European rings mm -hmm. where we may found uh, on them also uh, some ancient stones mm -hmm. or more originally this portraits or of mm -hmm. couple for wedding rings or of a ruler here with his name. Mm -hmm. So this was really a personal uh, ring Seal, to be yeah. worn by, mm -hmm. by, the, by the man and to, uh, as a symbol of as the, uh, authority. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it, the, the, the picture on it is very easy to read sure. also yeah. on the finger. A and it's on the hollow in gold like you would do with an intaglio. Exactly. It's the same use but different technique, exactly. I would say. Exactly. Okay. And uh, that's the same with uh, this, this type of ring. You can see the same process with having your name, your coat of arm, or some personal symbol. Here is, is a, it's a um, uh, man working at his desk, you know. Yes. And so he has his, a professional symbolic symbol image. or an aristocratic symbol with mm -hmm. your name around it in the stone or directly in gold as in, in this case. Okay. I've seen here and there some of the examples of bishop's ring. It was something important for the collector, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, because he had his first um, uh, emotional experience with rings when he was a very young boy, and he saw a bishop visiting, and he mm -hmm. was carrying this big amethyst episcopal ring. And to see a man wearing a ring 
for him was something very strange and very beautiful. And that's how he started thinking about ring and this men ring. So he had quite a, a number of medieval uh, bishop ring, which are not amethyst, but uh, sapphires. Mm -hmm. Sapphires. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I think we have seen a lot of pieces within the exhibition. Uh, there are, we said over 200 within the collection, so so many to discover. Uh, I think we have to to pick up to an end, of course, but we hope you enjoy being with us today. Stay with us because we're going to answer the questions you may have from WeChat or from Zoom. We'll be happy to, to answer, of course. Just a few elements before we, we end. Um, hope you enjoy the talk. This talk has been recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel of L'Ecole, but also um, next month, the 6th and the 7th of July, there will be something about one stone we did not mention in here, which is diamond. We'll talk about uh, the craftsmanship of diamonds from the rough to the cut of the diamond. And we'll, we'll get deeper with this topic in the evening conversation of July. So time for questions. I'm sure you, you have many. And I think a lot, Alice, for passing on the questions. Yes, she did. Thank you so much. Um, lots of key questions. So let me just pick up a few randomly, if I say. Um, did the wearer emphasize the color and the beauty of the stone, or did they emphasize the meaning of the stone? Well, uh, it's difficult to say because it's a personal according to taste. Of course. But in some cases, we can see there's a, a difference. They, they would make a very beautiful engraving on a, not a very beautiful stone, so mm -hmm. that it, it, it would be almost secret. You would have to print it to enjoy it, really. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would take a very beautiful stone that you would enjoy on your finger mm -hmm. immediately, Indeed. and you can even contemplate. And even the collector, Guy Ladrier, he told me what I like about wearing this is that you can have this monumental small scale piece of sculpture on your finger you can so they are both um, elements of uh, enjoyment of course yes. they are yeah. um, there is a question from our Japanese audience thank you so much for being with us today is there a trend on the theme or a trend on the technique over time things that change specifically Yes, of course, there is. For instance, it's very clear um, in the Roman period where they like the figure of Mercury because mm -hmm. it protects travelers, mm -hmm. trade, uh, good speaking. So uh, Fortuna, Fortune, of course, is very, very frequent on rings. Mm -hmm. uh, in Christian time, we'll find uh, protective uh, formulas scenes or, yeah. or scenes, mm -hmm. uh, figures. So there will be trends which are part of the possibility of dating mm -hmm. these tones. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, we have, um, let me read all the elements. There's one question um, about Mughal jewelry tradition, where there are also engraved gems. Uh, is there a link, or maybe a tradition that traveled from Europe to India or the other way? Well, it's a complicated question, actually. What we know for sure that for the Mughal uh, period, there were these uh, workmen uh, coming from Europe, from mm -hmm. Florence, uh, for instance, and we know that for, uh, from various sources. But anyway, in uh, Central Asia, there was this long-standing tradition. We've seen that it was the first, uh, the cradle, really, of, of liptics, and them, then yeah. Sassanids, uh, before Persia. the Islamic uh, invasion, uh, where uh, prominent stone carvers, mm -hmm. and after them, Seljukid, as we've seen, this uh, reused Sassanid stone. So there was a tradition anyway in India, in Sri Lanka, also of uh, gem mm -hmm. engraving. So it's, it's both, uh, both, both ways. places of yeah. the world have their tradition. Yeah. Great. Um, was the engraved gemstone done by one glyptician from beginning to the end, or were there multiple uh, experts involved in completing one piece? Well, that, that depends on what the piece is. When it's, mm -hmm. it's a very small piece, it's difficult. You can have somebody roughing it, you know, just starting to sketch it, and then okay. the master would finish it. Okay. But, Probably, but we have very little knowledge of this. What we know most of the time, it's a very solitary process, and it's usually what man uh, at his bench. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if it was like a big uh, workshop, workshop, but yeah. anyone would produce, I believe, his own 
piece. Okay. And that's not true, for instance, for bigger objects made of like half stone vases. Of or, course, yeah, uh, the large scale. La large scale piece which mm -hmm. okay. uh, work would be distributed among different workers. Okay, great. Um, we have um, also some questions from a uh, Chinese public from WeChat. Thank you so much, Mina, for passing on the questions. Um, it looks like most of the engraved gemstones, apparently of what we have presented, are relatively ancient. Example, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, or other. Uh, in modern times, uh, uh, are there fewer creations than before, or are they favoring reusing, remounting the older one? No, no, no. Uh, it would give a wrong impression because, of course, the more ancient pieces are them, often the more important mm -hmm. because they're rarer. Mm -hmm. But there is a huge uh, production of glyptics in 17th, 18th, and 19th century. Okay. And probably the mass of the pieces we see today in, in the market are, from in that period. are 18th and 18th, 19th century. And okay. we, we didn't show them, but in the collection there is a, a great number of, of those. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let me pass on. So many questions are coming at the same time. Um, a question of um, becoming a glyptician in these past days. Uh, were the skills passed down in family generation? Will be someone able to learn the skills from himself? What Do we have information on the training of them? Really, we don't we don't know anything. Mm -hmm. But we see in some cases, like Dioscorides, as I mentioned, his three sons were also glypticians. So okay. of course, father to sons. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. or the Miseroni more recently in the Renaissance. It's a mm -hmm. family okay. business. So of, of course, to learn the, the trade and this very um, complicated uh, skill mm -hmm. from uh, your childhood is very important. Of course, yeah. you start from, from day one with the master who yes. happens to be your father or someone from the family, indeed. Um, there's one question uh, in a more modern times about the use of shell cameos. Yes. Uh, was it the same technique? How can we make, can relate with, with stones cameos? So shell cameos are basically something which we call modern, that is say, uh, 15th, 16th century. Mm -hmm. uh, it was most worked in different places, in France and Germany mm -hmm. uh, during Renaissance time. And in 19th century, a lot in uh, Italy, mm -hmm. in Naples, where mm -hmm. a, a huge uh, fabric of those uh, cameos worn by yeah. women. Still and today, as souvenirs today. we can see. Yes, yeah. and there uh, it's cheaper and quicker to mm -hmm. work a shell cameo because the, the material is, is not as hard and the layers are always the same. So it's a, quite often a more repetitive uh, okay. product, production, which is not an interesting, but... but different. But yeah. different yeah. and uh, quite, yes, more a mass production. Okay, well, the question was also on the tools. Would they be drilling? To yes, them? that's yeah. exactly the same technique. Okay, yeah, exactly. but with a softer material, as exactly. you said. Okay, great. Um, Uh, there was a question about the Amphale on the way it was, uh, uh, if, if it was, if we have information on how it was worn, if it was no, worn. No, it's, yeah. it's a cabinet piece as yeah. the Hercules. As it's, it's a precious object to be, okay. to be kept and shown and, and discussed and contemplated. Okay, one final question, which is a, a general question. We already touched upon this one, but how do historians like you would date cameos and intaglios if there were so many revivals? Well, that's a tricky question. <laughs> and there are uh, various uh, criteria. So there's the question of uh, the type of stone, the way the rough stone is carved, even the profile of the cameo or the intaglio, mm -hmm. because it changed in time. There's the, the question of style, of engraving, of iconography. Mm -hmm. But even that way, uh, there are cases where it's difficult to, yeah, to they decide. Could replicate even, the same yes, they could replicate mm -hmm. uh, in 18th century very well ancient cameos. And there are mm -hmm. many uh, terrible histories of fakes and forgeries, and mm. uh, so it's a, it's a difficult subject. Okay, yes. but it's important to, to keep this in mind as it's yeah. it's a permanent topic probably yeah. when you have something in your hands. Um, I think we we have come to an end. Um, it was a pleasure to have you today. I just want to miss to wish to our Chinese audience who is 
a lot here today. A very happy Dragon Boat Festival, as I know it's in the period. So all the best for it. It was a great moment to have you all from all over the world because you know you were so many. Uh, we're looking forward to having you for our next talks and uh, hope you enjoy this one with us today. Have a lovely day and see you very soon. Bye. Goodbye.